Tonight's speaker is Steve Ambors. He's going to talk about snakehead fishing, and uh, I'll turn it over to him. And we've got, we have plenty of pizza, so enjoy. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thanks again for having me out here. It's always a pleasure to come out here. It's always a pleasure to come out and talk snakehead. I can pretty much do that anytime. The only thing I'd rather do more than talk snakehead is fish for snakehead. So. As we get things started here, I'll give you an agenda of what we're going to go through tonight. I'll stop every couple slides so you can go ahead and ask questions. And other than that, you will see some video content on here tonight. And the talk tonight, as you can see, is going to focus on spring snakehead fishing. It's the most timely for what we're going through right now. So I'll give you reports on what we've seen so far this year and what we expect to see in the next few weeks, next couple months. Folks, I was trying to put the other one on the stringer and I got picked up by another fish. Now what you're seeing right here was my first trip of the year of snakehead right here. And as I was reeling, as I was trying to put one on the stringer, another float dropped. So I had to hold the stringer in my mouth. But <laughs> sometimes you do what you gotta do out there. This is what it's about right here. But one of the great things about this time of year in particular, it's my favorite time of year to fish for snakehead. And there's multiple reasons for that. One of them is that you can get into a lot of other species while you're chasing snakehead. And I, I love crappy fishing, I love bass fishing. I love it all out there. So this time of year, especially with some of the tactics I'm going to explain to you, you got a really good shot at some really great multi-species day out there. Now, as I look out here tonight, I do see a lot of familiar faces because I have been out here once or twice. But if you're not familiar with me, if you're interested in watching some online content, I have hundreds of videos for Snakehead alone, a bunch of other species. And uh, me personally, I'm a teacher at heart. So what I try to do is have a nice mix of the fishing action and passing on the tips of the gear or the techniques of the fish themselves that can help you be successful on the water. So if you want to find me on YouTube, just search Cambo Trout Fishing, you'll find me on there. Uh, I am a U.S. Army veteran, husband, father of three. Thank you. Normally my wife is here in the crowd to keep me in check because she had to work late in the lab tonight. She's an MD, PhD student, University of Maryland. So hopefully next time I'll see you again here in the fall and then she'll be out here. Okay, so a few of the things we're talking about tonight. AM versus PM fishing. What part of the day do I think is best for you to go out there? Also, what are the snakehead doing? We're coming out of winter and moving into spring. What are they doing? What's the patterns you can use to get out? The pre-spawn bite. The pre-spawn bite is hands down my favorite bite of the year. And as we move on with this, I'll explain to you exactly why. Finding the structure. Lures versus live bait, when to use each. I'm gonna give you a bunch of different lures. We actually have a great layout over here from two of my teammates. This is Mr. Bush Huber of Real All American Fishing. He's also a guide out here. So if you're looking for somebody to put you on snakehead, I highly, highly recommend Bush. You're not gonna find a better guide out there. Next to him is Rashawn of Infamous Fishing. He's my fellow captain on Legion of Anglers. And when it comes to anything having to do with frogs or mice of any kind, he has a better selection than Bass Pro or just about any other shop that I've been in. Like if there's a new frog that comes out in Japan, he knows about it two weeks before it hits the market. <laughs> so, when you get a chance, like kind of after the talk, when we take a break, by all means come up here, check out their gear, their lures. They've got a great layout up here. And we'll touch on also shore fishing versus kayak fishing, the benefits and the drawbacks of each, rigs and gear, and then lastly, special techniques and safety. Because although we are getting into that happy time of year where it's gonna start warming up again in Maryland, there are some safety considerations because the water temperature is gonna lag behind the air temperature. But we'll hit that later. Okay, so first point, AM versus PM fishing. Me personally, I'm a guy who loves to be on the water as the sun is rising. I think it's one of the most beautiful times of day. And for me, a lot of fishing is just immersing myself in nature. It's what helps me deal with living in civilization is I can escape every now and again to get out to nature and really immerse myself in it. But with that being said, when you're dealing with either fall or spring snakehead fishing, generally speaking, the afternoon bite is gonna be your best because the water has had maximum time to warm in the afternoon. So when you're talking about early spring in particular, I'm generally gonna go ahead and aim for the afternoon fishing. And then as we get into like late spring towards summer, that's when you'll see me start fishing in the morning. Now, if I can fish all day, I'll fish all day. But you know, wife, three kids, dogs, everything else, I generally have to pick one half of the day. So early spring, if I have to pick one, definitely PM fishing. And late spring is when I'll start doing the morning fishing. 
So what are snakeheads doing? Well, this is still a bit of a contentious topic as far as the scientific literature goes. We found the scientific literature from Asia on snakehead when they arrived here, so we can start trying to understand what impacts, what behaviors we can expect from snakehead here as we try to manage the invasive you know, qualities of this fish here in the States. And in the scientific literature over in China, it gets very, very cold over there in a lot of their native range. And it's been documented over there that snakehead will actually bury themselves in the mud when it gets super, super cold. A question that's been kind of raging kind of back and forth is, are they doing that here in the States? And I think the answer is honestly, somewhere in between. Like there are times where I catch snakehead early in the season, there's an obvious mud slick on them. It almost feels like I'm pulling them out of the mud when I set the hook. But I've also talked to a lot of catfishers and catfishers will be throwing cast nets pretty much throughout the winter up to the edge of ice sheets trying to catch those mud shad, the gizzard shads that use it for bait. And every once in a while, they'll catch snakehead in those cast nets. And that means, you know, logically speaking, that they're not, at least not fully buried in the mud. There, there is some activity level there. Here we are in early spring, those fish are starting to ramp up their activity levels again. They're starting to become active. And that's especially gonna be in the afternoons. And we'll get into it in a minute exactly where I think you should be looking for them. But what you're going to see right here is actually the first snakehead that I caught in 2022. And after you see the video, I'll comment on exactly where he was and the things that I think helped me be successful in catching him. Yes. Oh, it's a snake. It's a snakehead. It's my first snakehead of 2022. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, come here, you beautiful beast. Come here. Gotcha. There she is, folks. The first of my snakehead <laughs> of 2022. So, not a bad fish. I think she came in around 22, 23 inches. But what I'm going to try and do here is scroll to a point and then pause it right here. So, this is a river here on the eastern shore, Dorchester County. And this water that I actually got this hit in is maybe about 15 inches deep at most. Up until this point, I had actually been fishing farther out on fishing on what kind of passes for a creek edge here, like over in Dorchester County. And I say what passes for because generally speaking, Dorchester waters are almost uniformly very shallow. So even the drop of a foot or two, even waters that are four or five feet are considered deep in those areas. I was fishing deeper and then I was keeping an eye out in the shallows. This is one reason that I really hate the wind because if you have calm waters and you're paying close attention, snakehead will give away their position because they're what's called an obligate air breather. They have to breathe atmospheric air periodically or they'll drown. And that's a great opportunity for you to locate them is to look and come and see. You'll hear it sometimes too when you take that sip of air. When they come to the top, as you have more experience, you'll be able to discern and tell the difference between a carp, a shed, or a snakehead rise. And I saw him rise. That's how I caught this fish as he gave himself away. I saw him rise, I paddled over, I put a minnow on him, within about 20 seconds that float was gone. And that's how I caught this fish. But another rule that is a general rule with snakehead, there's no such thing as too shallow. You, know, you can have, that's why they catch them in roadside ditches, you know, throughout Dorchester County. Snakehead, you can have a 30 inch snakehead in about six to eight inches of water. And they'll do it on the regular. So never think that the water is too shallow for a snakehead to be sitting there especially if he has top cover or something that makes him feel comfortable. Because that's exactly how I got this one. Okay, so my favorite time of year, the pre-spawn. So spawning, whether it's a female creating the eggs or males building up the muscle mass to fight other males, because if you're lucky enough, you will sometimes see that with what they call bull snakehead. Big male snakehead, you'll see them, they kind of circle each other and then they attack. And they circle each other and then they attack. So when you catch these snakehead in the pre-spawn and spawn period, and you see these big rips in their fins or like the scarring on their heads, that's a lot of times from these battles they're waging with each other for you know, essentially earning a mate. And the bottom line is that all that activity takes a lot of energy. So the, during the pre-spawn period, which is generally from right around late March, early April to about like early May, mid-May, those fish are feeding like crazy. 
Like I've gone out there and I've caught, you know, well over 20 snakehead all on top water in a half day's fishing and missed a lot more besides that. They're just the ones I landed. You, you're gonna miss fish. You, you're gonna miss a good number of fish when you snakehead fish. It's just the way it is because they have very hard mouths. They're very erratic fighters. The death rolls. There's a lot of reasons why. But anyway, top water is generally a pattern you're gonna use later in the springtime period. But the pre-spawn period, if you want to have your 20, 30, 40 fish days over the next month to month and a half is going to be one of your best shots to get that done. Like that. Just like that. Get off of there. Get off. There you are. There's number nine. There's number nine. They are in that timber. There's a common pattern I've discerned early in the season is that before the grass that they really like grows up, before it becomes nice and thick, what they'll relate to will be the timber. Not a big one, but a great proof of concept. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. So the point I was making right there, and you saw probably in the agenda, I said, it's all gonna be about finding structure. Snakehead very much relate to structure. But in the early part of the spring, there's not much vegetation around for the most part. So what the, the places you'll generally find those snakehead, it's gonna be up near shore, near brush, near submerged timber, or if there is some residual vegetation, like the skeletonized structure of the spatter dock or arrowhead or something like that, if there's some of that around, they'll relate to that as well. But the bottom line is, it's almost to our advantage to be quite honest, because once it's late summer and we have these giant pad fields, those snakehead could be anywhere in there. But in the early spring, in the mid spring, the structure is more limited. There's fewer places you generally have to target to find them. So find that structure and you'll find the fish. So I kind of touched on this, but there's one, or actually two words right here in bold text that I really want to pass on to you. And that's shallow coves, especially shallow coves with dark bottoms. Shallow coves with dark bottoms, especially here on the Eastern shore, they tend to warm faster than any other area on the river. So in early spring, in mid spring, those are the areas that I'm going to find. And you, you can do the recon through Google Earth. There are other different web tools you have out there. But those are the areas I'm gonna find because the experience has told me again and again and again, those snakehead are hunting that warm water, especially in the afternoons. And if you can find those shallow flats like that, you will find the snakehead and they will be feeding. Got him. Got him. Yeah. I totally just saw one rise, didn't I? Hello. Hello and good morning. There she is. And the other points I already made about re residual veg the vegetation, this is also Dorchester County. And it might be kind of hard for you to make out. But what, what's actually sticking out of the water here is what's left of the previous year's growth of the pad fields of the spatter dock. And that's another great place to find them because if there is any leftover vegetation, you're gonna find snakeheads in it. Snakeheads actually love that vegetation. And if all else fails, look for the submerged timber. You know, I say if all else fails, sometimes timber is just the best pattern, period. And one great, there's one great lure up here, Butch, could you hold up one of your swim baits real quick, dude? One of the best ways to exploit the timber out here is the real all-American curlies. And I got a video on this if you want to check it out. It says my new favorite swim bait. I started using Butch's stuff really heavy last year. And what he'll do is he'll take these curly tail frogs, he'll put those on a weighted swim bait hook. And what you do is you're essentially fishing a weedless, but then you can go ahead and bounce them off the timber. And that triggers a lot of really good reaction strikes. It's a great way to get them. Any questions here before I go to the next slide? Yes, sir. You were talking about top water a little bit later, but now I, I kind of got too confused. Uh, you're using minnows and a bobber now. Oh, okay. Okay, I, I see. So the, the question was exactly when am I using the top water and the transition between kind of live bait, lures, that kind of thing. So in the very early part of the spring, like when I first started targeting this year, I think was either very early March or very late February, one of the two. When I went out that day, I had minnows and I had inline spinners and swim baits. When I go really early in the season, I'm generally not throwing top water, you know, unless we have an unusually warm year, you know, because if I can't throw top water and I can catch them on top water, I will. 
It's by far the most exciting and most fun way to cash them. But the most effective ways to cash them when it's early in the season is going to be your large bait fish, mummy chogs, also known as bull minnows, small bluegills, small white perch, and I'll fish those on a one-off gamagatsu circle hook, about 12 to 18 inches under a float. Excellent way to target them. And what you can do, and I'll hit this again later just as a reminder, but I'll put out a rod over here with a float, a rod over here with a float, and then I'll usually stand up in my kayak, and what I'll use is like a MEP spinner. I love a MEP spinner number four for snakehead. And I'll fan cast, and then just I'm periodically checking my floats as I'm fan casting. It keeps me busy, it keeps me engaged, and I, I you know, I love catching snakehead, I, I love catching fish any way that I can, but if I, if I can get them on lures, that's the way I want to do it. But I still have fun watching a float drop. So I think that might have answered your question, but I'm gonna to get to it more later as well, that transition period between live bait and lures. Lures versus live bait, which is better? It really comes down to the conditions that you're fishing. Like I said before, as the water warms, in my experience, the lures tend to outperform the live bait. But there is a period in there, in the early part of spring, where minnows are by far the best. I'm still considering bringing them on Saturday for a trip that we're planning. If I do, Butch is probably gonna put me in the water. <laughs> he's definitely gonna want me to use lures out there but I'm still considering it because like for the past uh, week and a half two weeks we've had kind of a cold front hit you know prior to that we were catching them on lures and catching them solid and since the cold front hit that bite I won't say it stopped but it's definitely slowed down so I'm still considering if I'm gonna have minnows on Saturday or not but if you're asking me like for the general audience out there should you take minnows if you're going fishing this weekend I would say yes you're still in that early part of the season where minnows can really be the difference between a good day or a very, very slow day. But once you get into the different lures, these are just some of the classes of lures that I think you should probably have in your arsenal. That's going to be your topwater frogs and mice, your chatterbaits. So they have chatterbaits like these, which are kind of traditional. These are good for fishing medium depth water. But if you want a chatterbait style lure that runs much more shallow, a lot of folks don't know about this one, the Tekel Blade Waker. If you want to check one out, come on up here on a break or after we're done, and I'll show you exactly what it looks like. A Tekel Blade Waker is just like a chatterbait, only it runs much more shallow. Like you can fish that thing almost like a topwater lure at still a very slow cadence, which is just excellent. It's a phenomenal lure. But then, of course, your inline spinners of various types, buzz baits, and your swim baits. Those are your basic classes. Now, you can catch snakehead on pretty much any bass lure you throw. You can catch them on a Senko, wacky rig, you know, I, I don't care. Eventually, you're gonna catch a snakehead on it. They're opportunistic feeders, they're not specialized. So when it comes to the minnow rigs, I already hit this a little bit. A question I get a lot is, do I use a leader? No, I do not. I've never had an issue of snakehead being line shy, and I've never really had an issue of using straight braid with any kind of like complications from it tangling or anything like that. What I'll usually use is the float up top, and then about four inches above the actual hook, I'll have a very small split shot, like a 1 32nd, 1 16, something to keep that minnow down at depth. And then a one-off Gamagatsu circle hook, and I will lip hook these minnows. I know some folks prefer to back hook or tail hook. The best hookups that I've had have always come on the lip hooking. And like I said before, mummy chalk, white perch, bluegill, fallfish, and if you're going to be using mummy chalk, the minnows, you want the biggest minnows you can get your hands on. Like nice, big, stout minnows. If you can't find the big minnows, you can double hook the medium-sized minnows, and that'll kind of get you by. So the, the question was, why is it important to lip hook the minnow? One thing that you want to do when you're lip hooking minnows is really, if you can, only go through the bottom jaw. Because what you're trying to do here is keep that minnow as lively as possible for as long as possible. Because the more that minnow runs, the more noise and vibration it makes, the more it's going to give itself away to predators in the environment. So that, that's one reason I like to lip hook them, is that it keeps them nice and active. Because if you hook them, up, if you hook them by the tail and you're reeling them in and casting them out, reeling them in and casting them out, the water's going the exact opposite direction it should be through their gills and it's eventually going to kill them. That's why I like doing a lip hook right there. All right, so here's the slide I was talking about before. And this breaks it down exactly for you when I like to use each one of these lure classes. Now, does that mean that one of these lure classes won't work in one of the sections that I don't have it in? No, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, based on my experience, this is a good breakdown of what works and when 
most of the time. So early spring, the MEPS is my go-to. There's no doubt about it. Like when I when nothing else is working, I put on a number four MEPS and I can really get them. I prefer either a white MEPS with a silver blade, but I've also been doing really good on Fire Tiger lately. So that's another one that's really good to try. The real All American Curlies, Butch has been killing them already. Like especially on this new color that he has right here that I'm gonna have him make me some soon. Which is uh, the Venom with Silver Flake, is that right? Yeah, the Venom color with Silver Flake, I'm pretty excited to use that. I usually use his white with chartreuse tips, but I'm excited to try this new one. Uh, your chatter baits, your chatter baits are a good year-round lure to have. Like I would not go snakehead fishing without chatter baits in your pocket. Like that, that's one of the most no-fail lures you could possibly take with you. Like, like even in thicker grass, because chatter baits vibrate so hard that a lot of times they can shake that grass right off and not actually get all fouled up like a lot of other lures do. Your Tekel Blade Waker, which is again just like a really shallow running chatter bait. And then your swim baits. That, that, that one right there is a Mega Bass Spark Shad. That's one that served me really well in the past. Whatever I'm going to use, generally speaking, I do like it to be weedless. You know, early in the year it doesn't matter as much because generally speaking the vegetation hasn't grown up. But later in the year it comes in a lot. So that's what I say when I get to late spring, that's when I'm going to add the buzz bait to my arsenal. I'm going to start throwing top water a lot more. Because at that point, the snakehead are active enough that I don't have to play the subsurface game as much anymore. Because I mean, if you haven't had the snakehead pop in your life yet, if you haven't seen those blowups from those big snakehead, the sound of that suction that they make when they hit, it's addicting. Like, like once you hit that for the first time in your life, you'll go to bed and you'll be hearing that noise in your head as you're going to sleep. It, it's just a fantastic sound. The top water is by far the best way to catch them. But I have found that in the rain, I don't know what it is, but I mean, not, not a torrential downpour, but pretty steady beating rain. I've had a lot of luck on the buzz bait. Like when I'm in the rain out there, I will throw a buzz bait. Chatter baits are also another good choice, but man, they've really killed the buzz bait in the rain for me. Now, a lot of waters you'll find snakehead in are gonna be stained or tannic. And so what does that mean? Well, it means you're gonna add some vibration or some type of noise creation to your presentation. Otherwise, not gonna be able to find it. If they can't find it, they can't hit it. So when it comes to the stained and tannic water, vibration, vibration, bouncing off the timber to create that noise. And then of course, with your top water frogs and mice, you have normal tips and you have concave tips for the popping varieties. I would have both in your inventory because there's been days out there where I've been fishing with a buddy. I'm using a regular frog, he's using a popping frog. We're fishing it, other than those two differences, completely the same and he's outfishing me at least five or six to one. That's the wrong side of the, <laughs> of the scale to be on. So definitely have both on you, the popping variety and the regular. And the last one is gonna be thick cover. Thick cover can be a conversation in and of itself. I, I actually have a video on just how to fish snakehead in thick cover. But of course you want your top water frogs. I prefer in those cases to use the regular nose because a popping nose going through thick cover is gonna get hung up a lot. It, it, like even if it doesn't get actually hooked on it, that open mouth on the like the popping portion of that lure is going to hit the stalks on the rotation. It's going to hit the timber. It, it's just going to be an annoyance for you. It's going to get hung up way too much and you end up spooking fish. But your weedless swim baits, whether the spark shad or the real American curly, and your weedless inline spinners, those are all good options. But I guess the one thing I would say is since we are talking about thick cover, the line that I use right now is called Berkeley X9. Now, I've thrown Suffolk Sprayed, I've thrown Power Pro, and Rashawn turned me on to Berkeley. And I can tell you right now, it's the best braided line I've used. Like, it's so much smoother coming off the reel. It's the, the castability, the strength. But aside from Berkeley X9, which I think is just great in and of itself, there's also Berkeley X5. And X5 is specifically designed for you to fish the heaviest cover out there, be it timber, grass, whatever you're actually going after. But the thing you have to keep in mind is, I would roll with no less than 40 pound test when you're fishing that really thick cover. Because at the end of the day, when you set the hook on a fish, sometimes you're not just reeling in or setting the hook on that fish. You're reeling in or setting the hook on everything it's in too. Be that 10 pounds of grass or a limb or anything like that. Because there's sometimes out there that I will cast purposely. <clears throat> I will look back, like especially on the Transquaking or the Chicken Macomico or some of these rivers we have over in Dorchester. What you see where the water hits the shoreline is not the shoreline. 
there's another 20 or 30 feet of flooded forest or flooded brush going back. And if you get right up on that flooded edge, that's when you realize like, oh my God, like there's like 30 more feet back here where these snakehead could be like sitting and I'm, I'm never even gonna know it unless I get this close to it. When you're casting through that kind of stuff, that's when you wanna make sure that you have that line that you can use to get them out. Cause there's times I'll cast knowing I have no idea how I'm gonna get that fish out of there. But I know there's a good chance that when I'm casting to, there could be one sitting there. And I'll just, I'll figure it out once I actually hook them. That, that's kind of how I approach it sometimes. So the blade waker, there is a presentation. I'm not really good at it. I'll be straight up honest with you. Cause like, this is another lure that Rashawn introduced me to. But when it comes to the thick cover, the blade waker is one that you can fish on top as if it's a top water lure. And I, I'm, I'm being like dead serious, like right on top. It'll just wiggle back and forth, make that commotion, occasionally pop out. But the thing that the blade waker really excels at is that say you have water where you have a lot of like coontail, whatever it is, hydrilla, and it's coming off the bottom. And you only have maybe about, you know, about three or four inches of water sitting on top of that grass. Chatterbait's not gonna do well for that because you would have to burn that chatterbait in to keep it out of that deep, deep grass. The blade waker, you can isolate that three to four inches and still slow roll it. That, that's why it's such an important lure to have in your arsenal because without it, you're not really gonna have a chatterbait type lure that can fish that shallow. It's, a, it, it's, it's done really, really good things for us in that part of spring before the grass makes it all the way to the top or in your tidal waters. Like some, some tidal waters at high tide, you'll have that three, four or five inches of water on top of the grass. And then at low tide, you know, you're pretty much limited to a top water frog or mouse because the water levels come down and now it's just a grass mat. Uh, question over here? Yeah, when you get into lower light, I mean, do, are they, do they have a super sensitive lateral line where the paddle tails are more productive than say, uh, a naps? So when it comes to low light, I think the best that I've done in low light has been, I think on the popping frogs. The popping frogs have served me really well in low light, as have the blade wakers, and depending on water depth, the chatterbaits. Now, another technique that Rashawn likes to use is taking those paddle tails and bringing those across the grass mats, like the mega bass bar chat or something like that. They've done really well too. I just don't know if it's a great low light technique or not. Now, in terms of the sensitivity of their lateral line, I can't give you a confident answer on that. You know, I, I know it's sensitive, but I can't say like it's more or less sensitive than any other species out there. In my experience, the noise helps, but they do tend to be a sight-oriented predator when it comes right down to it. So the Tekel inventory goes beyond the Blade Waker, of course, and two lures that you also might want to think about. And for a long time, I've stayed away from them because at the end of the day, I classify myself as an economical fisherman, you know, because I, I have my limited budget that I can allocate, you know, that doesn't isn't going to cover school lunches and uniforms and all that kind of stuff, right? So, the Tekel Blade Waker, excuse me, the Tekel Honker and the Tekel Maracker are two great frogs. They are kind of expensive compared to a lot of other frogs out there. You're going to probably pay at least probably twelve bucks for it or so. But with that being said, they are very high quality. They last a long time and they just flat out catch fish. And uh, I actually, do I have one tied on right now? I do, okay. The Tackle Warehouse gives a veteran's discount. <laughs> so this one right here, this is the Tackle Honker. So what I can do, or if you wanna come up anytime after you know a break or anything like that to check this out, it's an excellent, excellent lure. You can see those legs hang off on barrel swivels and they make a lot of noise on the surface. The Maracker is similar, only it has a rattling silver paddle tail that also attaches by a barrel swivel. So the Tekel series of lures are very high quality lures. They will cost a little bit more than your average frogs you might get offline or get a you know, Walmart Target, something like that. But it is worth the investment. Just, I mean, at the end of the day, you're gonna be throwing 40 or 50, 50 pound rate anyway, so you aren't likely to lose it. Not real likely anyway. I have, uh, you motivated me to ask four questions. I'm sorry, but when you're fishing uh, early with uh, with live bait, do you like a popping frog when you're fishing big open water and you're trying to let them know there's something going on over where you're throwing? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, so the question was, was basically, you know, when you're using a 
frog in open water, do you like to have the pop style frog? And the answer is absolutely yes, I do. But also on using live bait like minnows. Oh, okay, okay. Just to, just to kind of. So I know that some people out there have been using things like popping corks or other things like on surface to kind of get the fish's attention. I haven't used a popping frog like in almost like a way to call them in to where my bait is. I haven't tried that. But I do know some folks out there that have been using popping corks or like rattling bobbers or something like that to add a little bit more attractive quality. Because when you are fishing water that's more stained or more tannic, it is harder for them to find minnows. So if you do have some type of sound attracting quality, it is kind of a good way to go. A couple more. Um, the Z-Man Pro chatterbait versus the jackhammer. What do you think? <sighs> so both of them are an upgrade from the original. Like, like, I, like I'll, I'll say that with 100% confidence. Because one thing I look for whenever I'm using any kind of chatterbait is the wire clip they have attaching it to the, from the lure to the line. The last thing you want to use is a lure for snakehead that's light wire because snakehead are hard on gear. If it's a light wire hook, a light wire snap, I can guarantee you eventually you're going to regret using it because the hook is either going to bend out, the snap swivel is going to break or just bend out and then you're going to be stepped, you know, the fish will only exist in memory at that point. So now between the jackhammer and the pro, I don't feel like I've used both of them enough to give you a good answer. So I don't want to give you an answer on where the yeah, other. The reason I was asking, uh, you know, if I'm throwing past the snake and try to pull it forward, if I use a regular chatterbait, it takes like two feet for it to really start sh shaking underwater. The jackhammer seems like as soon as I pop it, it starts moving. Th does this one do the same thing immediately start working? Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, another question. Uh, in stained tannic water, you know, where you fish and I fish, um, I, I use flukes, paddle tails. And um, you had mentioned several times about using an underspin. Mm -hmm. So could yes. you elaborate on that? Yes, I, I, I'm glad you asked that because that's one lure class I haven't really touched on yet. Any kind of soft plastic, whether it be a paddle tail or the real American curly or something like that, underspins are a great way to go. Now, you have two different ways you can tackle that. One is an actual hook that comes with an underspin on it. Another is when you have small blades that are attached by a barrel swivel to a corkscrew, and you can corkscrew that into the soft paddle. So there's a couple of different ways you can do it. But the bottom line is that when it comes to adding flash to your soft plastics, I definitely highly encourage that because the snakehead definitely respond to anything with flash in it. Like the 10 pound snakeheads that they were harvesting down the Potomac, the most plentiful by quantity source of bait for those 10 pound snakeheads or killifish and hummy chogs. It's, you know, basically three to four inch at most little minnows. And they'll just eat them one after the other, after the other, after the other. So adding flash to your lures like that, whether you have underspin or an actual blade attached to a corkscrew, either way is a good way to go. Oh, and here you go, here's a good example. So talking about underspins, thank you, Butch. Right here, you can see that blade hanging down off the bottom. It's a little willow leaf blade on here. That little bit of flash can make a world of difference, especially on a day when snakehead are finicky. Because there's some days you'll go out there and snake, it feels like snakehead are going to bite anything that hits the water. There's other days you can go out there where they're not going to hit anything. I don't care what you do. And I've been doing this for a while. And I can tell you there's still some days I go out there and get skunked. And I know the fish are there. They're just not eating. And that's the way it is with snakehead sometimes. But in terms of putting as much as you can in your favor, adding some flash to it, definitely. Good question. Any questions on this slide before we get to the next one? So if you have any questions about chatterbait, I'll let you know. And I'll tell you what, I have every chatterbait in the world that yep. has been made, and I'll also tell you how to add more flash to it, or cut the side of the skirts, because you can buy it on Tackle Warehouse, and you can actually add more flash to a chatterbait. And the jackhammer, the difference is, it, the, um, the lead inside of it is different than the, the Pro, and you can get it in the quarter out, so if you're deep, you can get down there. But, I'll ask you any questions you got about gear. I'm telling you, like, Rashawn is who I lean on when I have questions about gear. It's like when it comes to, like, you know, reading about snakehead, looking at techniques and their patterns, that's, that's my wheelhouse. When it comes to questions like, what's the latest gear, that's the man right there. I'm telling you right now. And shore fishing for snakehead, especially on the bridges around Dorchester County, 
If you can find a bridge access point that has a shallow cove next to it, that's one place you can legitimately go and catch 20, 30, or 40 snakehead from shore. And not, not a problem. That pre-spawn period can be absolutely fire. But of course, like one of the drawbacks when it comes to shore fishing is that if you see the fish rising way over there, you know the fish is rising way over there and you can't really get to it. So at the end of the day, while I do both, and I'll show you videos from both right here. At the end of the day, while I do both, I do prefer uh, kayak or boat fishing, but especially kayak because it opens up so much water to you. And, and I feel like kayaks are really becoming more and more popular as time goes on. Even if you feel like you're not really up for it physically, they're coming out with a lot of different ways, a lot of different mo like models of kayaks to pretty much support anyone out there. So if you haven't tried kayak fishing yet, it's just, I can't express enough, it's the best fishing investment I ever made. Like the amount of water that a kayak opens up for you, especially when you talk about snakehead fishing, when you're getting back in these really shallow coves and shallow creeks, it, it's, I can't say enough just how important it is to be able to open up that water. What did I say? What did I say? Yes. Nice one. Oh, it's gonna make a cool video right there. Yeah. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Folks, the free spawn bite is on. <laughs> so a couple things in that video that I'll highlight. Where I originally got that fish was exactly one of those little shallow coves off from the main stem of a creek that I told you about, around that kind of submerged timber. The other point that I'll make is you see the net I'm using right there. You want a deep rubberized net. You want it to be deep because snakehead are extremely adept at jumping out of nets. I mean, it's from what they are escape artists to the, you know, nth degree. It's incredible how proficient they are at finding escape routes out of a kayak, out of wherever they are. It's just incredible. But aside from that, why do I say rubberized? Well, there's two reasons. A rubberized net will do much less damage to the slime coating on a fish. And that, that's how a fish like, protects itself from infection, is that slime coating they have on their body. So in terms of fish you might want to release, if you want to release them healthy, having a rubberized net is a great way to go. The other thing that makes rubberized nets more practical is that whatever hook you're using, it's much easier to get it out of a rubberized net than it is a nylon net. You know, that's just the, the nature of the material itself. And I, I'll get to one point later about treble hooks, but the snakehead death roll. And if you haven't experienced that yet, you'll be surprised the first time you actually see how much power these fish have. Like I, I've seen them death roll on a pair of pliers and they literally rip their jaw. Like they're, they're explosively powerful fish. And when they do that inside of a net, and they death roll. If you have trouble hooks in there, you're gonna have a heck of a time trying to get your hooks out of that net if it's not rubberized. Even if it's rubberized, you might have a pain, but nowhere near as much as you would if it was in a nylon net. Okay, so this was a day that Rashawn and I were out shore fishing for snakehead as well. Jeez. He hit as soon as he hit the water. Holy crap. Another nice snake. Another nice one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I am having a good time, folks. God, I'm having a good time. Wonder if I got that jump on camera. Man, I hope I did. Folks, I said earlier today that if you can get out on the water, get out on the water. And this is why. We got a cold front coming in. This water is darn near calm. You may have even just heard that other fish jump. I'm seeing fish rise everywhere. <laughs> These prefrontal conditions are prime. Just prime. Oh, what a beauty. What a thick beauty. So you can see the lure I'm using right there is that MEPS inline spinner. It's either number three or four in Fire Tiger. And on this particular day, I was out there and I started seeing them rise. And that's when you know in early spring, when you start seeing them rise, that's when they're starting to try to really get ready for that activity level boost because they're trying to take in as much oxygen as they can. And I was throwing spinner baits, I was throwing chatter baits, I was throwing blade wakers, I was throwing, you know, underspin, swim baits. I couldn't get anything. 
We took a bite and I was watching it. It was all around me. It was driving me crazy. I was like, all right, let me put on the maps because like I was trying to branch out, trying new stuff. Sometimes old reliable is the way to go. And I mean, I mean, that's my number one survival lure. It put me in any survival situation on the planet. If I have to use one lure, it's probably gonna be the maps. You use the term prefront. Do you like a prefrontal situation other than post? I would prefer we just have nice weather all the time. But <laughs> you know, in the world in which we inhabit, yes, I do like prefrontal rather than post. And <clears throat> You know, one thing that you could do, and I do recommend as fishermen out there, is keep a fishing log. You know, record the conditions that you're going out in. Record the conditions that existed prior to you going out. Look at what lures worked, what lures didn't, where you fished, all that kind of stuff. And especially if you hook a fish or you get a hit. Look at what you were doing. Look at how fast you were retrieving it. Look at all that kind of stuff, what structure you were fishing. If you record that kind of information over time, you're going to learn a lot more than you will if you don't pay attention to those kind of details. If you're, if you're having a slow bite, do you slow down and then also go a little smaller? Yes, very, another very good question. So the question was, if I have a slow bite, do I slow down and downsize? Yes, I do. When I was out there using this MEPS, one reason I love the MEPS so much among all the other spinners that are out there on the market is just how easily that blade spins. That means I can slow roll that thing almost as slow as I could possibly want to. And sometimes that's what it takes. And for those of you who've heard me before, you're probably going to groan when I say this, but the number one thing I always tell people that are new to snakehead fishing is the number one mistake I see people make when they're snakehead fishing is they're working their lures too quickly. You know, this isn't striper fishing. It's not bass fishing. There are days where they will hit just about anything that moves, but the best bites I've ever had is when I'm being patient and I'm working my lures slowly. Like I will literally twitch a frog or a mouse, let it sit for five, 10, even 15 seconds before I twitch it again. You know, it, it's not like a continuous, like twitch, 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 twitch. Like I, I've seen people burning in whopper ploppers and I'm just looking at them like, do I give them advice? Like I don't even know this guy, you know? <laughs> so, but if I had to give people advice when it comes to snakehead fishing, if you're not catching them, slow down. And when it comes to downsizing, of course, the maps I was using right here, I was throwing before this, I was throwing the spinner baits and the blade wakers and the chatter baits, which are all at least twice as big as that maps. And I downsized to this, and that's when I started catching. But one note I will give you on the maps right here. The maps, while durable for most other species of fishing, not that durable holding up the snakehead. Now, maps has recently come out with a more durable, more heavily built model. What's the exact, exact name of that, bro? Bronze Slammer. Bronze Slammer, thanks. It's got a BMC hook on it. There you go. What's it called, Ron? Bronze Slammer. Bronze, yeah. Bronze. Bronze Slammer is the new MEPS they've come out with. And they designed it to be a more durable, you know, heavier <laughs> wire. Now, that being said, Rashawn has had an experience recently where a snakehead literally broke his hook. And that's, it's not the first time I've heard that. So I guess that's another good point out there. Make sure you have your drag set. When it's, it's tough with snakehead, because on the one hand, I'm gonna tell you have your drag set so you can at least pay out a little bit. On the other hand, I'm gonna tell you that you need to set the hook with everything you have because snakehead have really hard mouths. And if you don't put everything you have into the hook set, you might not get them. But getting back to the point I was making about the MEPS here, after you catch a snakehead, inspect your hooks. Make sure that the hook hasn't bent out. Make sure the shaft hasn't bent. Because I caught two snakehead this day and then I got at least two or three more hits from Snakehead and didn't hook up. And then as I was getting ready to pack up and leave, I looked at my, my MEPS. One hook was actually bent in and the shaft of the entire thing was bent to the side. And it, it may happen fighting the fish, it may happen with them death rolling, it may happen when you're trying to get the hook out. All of that's possible, but keep an eye on your hooks. Definitely check your lures before you throw back out. So. If you're going out, and like I said, it's been kind of a rough week, week and a half in terms of weather. <clears throat> if you're going out, unless you're, you know, ethically opposed to it, or you really want to challenge yourself, which I respect. You know, I, I respect going straight lure game. I really do. I love throwing lures. Okay. But I talked a little bit about double rigging minnows. If you can't find the nice big minnows, you can put more than one minnow on a hook with that lip hook action. Uh, fan casting, I touched on a little bit too, having floats out and then fan casting a lure. Just be cognizant, especially if it's windy. Of where your line is otherwise you're going to end up casting over your slack line and you're just going to have a mess to undo and it's going to be a real pain for you the last one i'll show you the video for is actually trailing a bobber behind you that can produce its own complications because the minnow can get hung up in structure and you got to circle back around 
and get your stuff unsnagged. But anyway, I will show you both of these videos real quick just to give you this kind of tips in action. What I'm doing with this, with the minnow rig that is, is I'm trailing it behind me, probably about 30 to 40 feet. And I just happen to turn around and see all those bubbles right over there. That's where she smacked it, the little rascal. It may seem like common sense for some of y'all out there, but in case you don't know, you want to have the biggest bait that you can for snakehead. Biggest bait fish, I should say. Within reason, I guess up to about <laughs> five inches or so. But the biggest minnows you can get your hands on, put it that way. But if you can't get jumbo minnows, like these minnows ain't bad. I'm not saying they're bad, but they're not jumbo either. What you can do is double or triple hook them. And then you have a much more enticing meal for a big hungry snakehead out there. Now, like I said, you are inviting some chaos. The more lines you have out, the more chaos you're inviting into your life. Like you saw that video where I kicked off up here, where I literally had the stringer in my mouth. So I had two snakehead on the stringer. I was trying to put a third on and then my other float dropped for number four. So, you know, I didn't tell my wife. So she, she doesn't, yeah. I brushed my teeth first though, before I kissed her son. <laughs> you don't watch the yard, I can see it now. If you're having a tough day and you can't find snakehead, have you ever just taken uh, along a bucket of minnows and thrown handfuls of minnows in certain areas to see if there's anything there? So the question was, if I have, if I've been having a tough day, I just haven't been able to find the snakehead. Have I ever kind of like seeded the water with minnows just to see if like throwing them out gave me any action? The answer is no. But one thing I do and have done in the past is that if I can't find where they are, what I'll do is I'll actively start trying to spook them. I'm gonna go up and I'm gonna cruise the shoreline right up, right up to it, hitting it, like hitting timber. I'm gonna go into the pad fields. I'm gonna start moving through that noisily. You know, if people are around me, I'm not gonna be a complete idiot, you know, and be spooking fish all around them. But if I can't find the snakehead, I mean, step number one is finding the fish and figuring out where, where they are. And then I can play with, you know, okay, what do they want? But that's what I'll do if I can't figure it out by casting, is I'll start taking my kayak through those different areas to see if I can spook them so I, I can say at least I know where they are and then figure out the rest of the equation. How sensitive are they to the noise of a trolling motor? Snakehead, generally speaking, are pretty sensitive. <laughs> I consider them a spooky fish. I, I definitely do. So, especially this time of year. Yeah, especially this time of year. If someone comes through with a loud motor, it's probably going to spook them out for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, like, like if someone, like, it's, I've had some frustrating times before because I'll be fishing a flat and then somebody will crew is right to the flat that I'm fishing. And that's a lot of times that's literally going to chase them out because I'll, I'll give you a good uh, example of exactly what I'm talking about. I was actually catfishing with a buddy Oren down in Virginia. And one thing you got to do when you're catfishing is catch bait. So he, down in Virginia, he's got a license. He puts out a gill net, right? What we would do then is take his motorboat and corral them and try to chase them into this gill net. And by doing that, we call snakehead in the net. Now, if you're in the middle of the channel, going down a river, moving between points on an electric trolling motor, I don't think it's gonna be that big of an issue for you. But when you're actively fishing, I would be leery of using it, if, especially too close to cover. You'd probably be catching most of the fish at the end of your casts. In my kayak, I have a pedal drive. Now, I use that pedal drive when I'm going in between areas but I generally don't use it that much when I'm actively fishing because kind of for that reason, like even though that thing is pretty darn quiet, I don't want to take the chance of spooking them like that. So the last thing I'm going to hit on here is safety. A couple points, let's get into the environmental safety stuff first. Although it is getting warmer, those water temperatures, generally speaking, are still down in the low fifties from what I've seen. You know, if you're lucky, if you're, in, if you're in bigger water, it might be a little bit chillier than that. So a rule that I've heard, and again, I'm going to say I've heard, is that if you add the water temp and the air temp together and it's not above 120, that's a good indicator you should probably be wearing a dry suit. And the reason for that is, you know, I, I've been, I've jumped into lakes that have, have recently iced out. And this is over, this is up, you know, when I was stationed in Colorado. And it's really wild how that cold water can just make all the air leave your body. You know, and it's, I had to turn around on my back and just kind of tread water until my body was used to it, then I was good. But the bottom line is that that's when I was intentionally going into the water. Like, I feel like a lot of people always think about it, well, I'm a great swimmer, or, you know, I, I have this, I have that. 
Odds are, when you're going in the water, it wasn't intentional. Maybe you hurt yourself. Maybe your arm or your leg is hurt. Maybe you hit your head. All of that stuff. So, I mean, wear your PFDs out there. And if it's cold, if it's that 120 rule is less than that, I recommend a dry suit. Dry suits are pricey. So I'm not gonna say you won't see me out there sometimes like an idiot without a dry suit. But that's one thing, it's a point I like to make because at the end of the day, no fish is worth you not coming home to your family. Now, getting back to the specific snakehead focus of this safety brief. Like I said before, snakehead will death roll. You want to be using lip grippers and you want a nice deep net to handle these fish. Because I'm going to show you this video right here. And I want you to picture what might have happened if instead of me having a single hook lure, if I was using, say, a whopper plopper that has two treble hooks on it. Big tie after this one. Jesus. <laughs> Damn. This will happen. There you go. Multiple, multiple, <laughs> multiple times when you're dealing with snakehead. And I don't really care how experienced you are either. Snakehead, like I said before, are incredible escape artists. They're extremely explosively powerful. And the last thing you want is to have one set of hooks in you and the other set of hooks in the fish with a snakehead thrashing. You do not want that in your life at all. So use your lip grippers, use your nets, and I'm not saying don't use treble hooks, because I mean, you can see I use them at least on the mets. I just don't use most double trebles anymore. If you are gonna use them, be extremely careful out there. It's just, they are a handful, an absolute handful. Yes, and that's another great point, thank you. You're probably gonna be using braid out there. Your hands are probably gonna be wet on top of it. I recommend against grabbing the line because when they are just death rolling or head shaking, it's so powerful, it's gonna cut right through your, the line's gonna cut right through you. You don't want it. But, ladies and gentlemen, pending any questions, that concludes the actual seminar portion. I see one question right here. Yeah, oh, right, go for it, man. Quick and easy ones. Uh, with minnows, do you prefer a certain type of bobber? So the question was, when it comes to minnows, do I prefer a certain kind of bobber? I generally prefer the round weighted cork floats. And I mean, you if you've seen my videos, you've probably seen me use the more cylindrical weighted floats that are also cork. But what I've come to uh, find over time is that I get a lot less line twisting with the more round cork weighted floats than I do the more cylindrical ones. The more cylindrical ones tend to wrap up on themselves, especially if the minnows are swimming around a lot. And question number two. The other one, uh, since you said you, use, you don't use a leader, what is your preferred not to use with braid? Good question. So the question was, since I don't use a leader, what is my preferred not to use with braid? Palomar. Palomar through and through. It is a quick knot to tie. It you know minimizes how much time I'm tying knots on the water, therefore maximizes the time I'm fishing. And when it comes to braid, I really haven't had any issues with the Palomar failing me. Like the Palomar thing is actually the easiest knot to tie with braid because braid slides over itself much more easily than fluoro or mono does. I have, I have one more question. Who's going to be the first person this year to catch a snakehead on top water? It's already happened. Okay. You, you claim that this year, Butch? It has already happened. Now, now not, not with we three right here. E each of us have caught snakehead this year, but not, not on top yet. But we do know we have a few buddies out there who have got them on top. And it, it was happening right before that, you know, this week and a half of relatively cold weather hit. Our teammate. Yeah, 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 yeah. One of our teammates, yeah, Dave. And the other, yeah. and the other guy, uh, Tyler. Got yep, and Tyler got one on top. Yep. And they were fishing in Delaware, Del Delaware waters at the time when they got them on top. This is a new well, fishery, but I, I, I see you releasing them. And from what I've heard, it, are, the, are the concerns about their invasive nature overstated, or is this something that has got legs to it? So it's, a, it's complicated. And I'll, I'll say that and then I'll break it down for you. Um, so first of all, I was raised to not kill anything I'm not gonna use. So a, a lot of times if my freezer's full and I don't have anyone to give it to, then I will release it. I also love these fish. They have a lot of qualities about them from the way they parent their young and guard their fry, courtship rituals and how they mate. There's just so many fascinating qualities about these fish. That being said, they are not from here. They are a new species in our ecosystems. 
and they are label invasive at the federal level. I didn't say this at the beginning, I work at a nonprofit called the American Fishery Society. And it's, it's the nation's, the world's largest society dedicated to fisheries management. So one perk that I have is that my, my friend is the editor, so whenever new science comes across his desk to be published and he thinks I might be interested in it, he's like, hey man, you should check this out. So I've dug pretty deep into the scientific literature that exists so far here in Maryland, Virginia, Delaware. I've interviewed fisheries biologists, and the best answer I have for you is that the degree that snakehead will be invasive and have an impact on our native species depends on the environment. If it's an area that has established predators, that has deeper waters, or at least a variety of waters, you're probably not going to see that much impact. If it's an area that historically has been a nursery ground with almost uniformly shallow, muddy bottoms like black water, your odds are you're going to see more impact because they're moving into that top position with nothing to outweigh their effects. Mm -hmm. My best answer for you is that A, the media being the media, every picture you ever see of snakehead is going to be this like toothy zoomed in view on the mouth and it's going to be the frankenfish and we're all going to die. <laughs> so so do, I, do I think some of it's overblown? I do, but do I also recommend against spreading them anywhere? Yes because even if there has been minimal impact or no impact seen in most of the peer-reviewed published, published literature yet, when they get into new environments, the script may completely flip and they may have a really detrimental impact. And one point that I've heard made by a fisheries biologist that I really agree with is that don't we want variety? Like don't we want, don't we want to actually have waters we can go around and catch a bunch of different species as opposed to only a few? So while I love snakehead, I try to like, share the perspective that there are environments where they seem to be having an impact and we shouldn't spread them. They're going to spread themselves enough. Like the impulse, the instinctive impulse for snakehead to explore and get to new areas is like nothing I've ever seen. And these things can jump three, four, five feet into the air above and past waterfalls and everything else. Incre incredibly fascinating species. Like, this, this presentation I gave right here was really just on like how to catch them in the spring for the most part. Uh, presentations I've done in the past are actually talking about their biology because it's just really fascinating, the species itself. So I hope that answers your question. That it, it is kind of complicated. They are labeled invasive and they shouldn't be spread. You didn't mention having something to put them to sleep with. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, when it comes to dispatching snakehead. Yeah. <laughs> so I agree. Uh, the best way that I've seen to dispatch snakehead is a ball peen hammer and then slicing their gills. Slicing their gills not only kills them, it also bleeds them out and makes it for a much cleaner process of filleting them later. But when it comes to actually dispatching them, a ball peen hammer or anything like it does really well. You, you were talking about warm, dark bottom, muddy water. How, how far north do you go? Like when I was stationed at Aberdeen, mm -hmm. the flats are, you know, uh, flats are what they used to me. But um, have you been up there? Have you had success in the, in the flats in the Susquehanna Flats? Or I haven't really fished the Susquehanna Flats yet. I have friends who have and who've done well. But I feel like they've done well for the most part up there once the grass has grown up. Okay. Now, what they should start catching really soon at the base of the Conowingo are the snakeheads. Because snakeheads do what's called a spring push. You, you can almost think of it similar, but not to the same extent as salmon run upstream. Snakehead push upstream to like the farthest obstruction they can, which they can't get past. They congregate and then they pair off and they go mate. But the past several years, around the April time frame, almost kind of coinciding with the shad run up there for the hickories and the Americans, they've been catching a lot of snakeheads up there at Conowingo. So if that's your cup of tea, that kind of fishing, good place to go. Okay. And just saw the news today, they just had that Conowingo, they have a fish tube that they're collecting all yep. invasive species yeah. at Conowingo. Yep. yep, that's a, it's called Whoosh. And yeah, it's, a, it's, a, uh, <laughs> it's actually an exhibitor we've had at one of our AFS meetings, American Fishery Society. If you haven't seen it before, look up Whoosh online, W-H-O-O-S-H. It's pretty cool that they, they use it to transport salmon over and around like big obstructions from like hydroelectric dams. It almost shoots the salmon out, like almost like it's a really long tube or a cannon. It, it's pretty wild. In your experience, uh, it's no secret, Dorchester, Blackwater area, there's plenty. Uh, have you fished 
Cat Island, uh, Cotton Creek, Chipping Creek. To your knowledge, are they are there enough? I know they are here. Uh, are there enough to uh, target them specifically? I haven't I haven't fished those waters specifically. Butch, have you fished those in? Well, but Bush has fished those. He, he's giving me a look that he's, he's feeling kind of tight-lipped over there, but he has fished those waters. <laughs> <laughs> so, as, as locals, in, in, my, in limited time in the afternoon, is I've caught them in the area, but are the numbers here? The, they are, and it's going to be here in the next couple of weeks where they'll start pushing up under the docks. There you go. I'll tell you, Real American Guide Service. I, I've been out with them. You're not going to find a better guy down there. All right, guys, apparently it was a good talk. Uh, again, that's why they call him the snake fishing king, catching king instead of just fishing. Let's take a break real quick. Uh,